Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Vivian Aqua and I call myself the Certified Diversity Consultant of Amplify DEI. I talk about a lot of things when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. And welcome to Let's Humanize the Workplace where I'm having different experts, different uh, people talking about the different things that are necessary to humanize the workplace. But before I dive in together with Andrew and April, I do wanna touch upon a thing that I shared when it comes to uh, neurodiversity. So this morning, and maybe it's uh, maybe you just noticed it, maybe you, you haven't. This morning I shared a post about being neurodivergent. So I recently went to Bilbao just to recharge my batteries, but also to process whatever it is that is happening at the moment when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, as a neurodivergent, I need the time to wusa and to debrief and to do the things that are necessary for me to be able to recharge. Uh, but I was thinking about Transformers. I am a Transformers fan. I really, really love Transformers. And no, this is not for only for boys or for men or for whomever. There are women, girls, and other genders who like Transformers. And then it came, then the, the census came upon me like, being neurodiverse is being more than meets the eye. And then it got me thinking about why I call myself neurodivergent. So I have been through this whole virtual reality experience where I could literally walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and this person is neurodivergent. And I came to the realization, noticing the little things that this person is noticing, noticing um, noticing, you know, being in your own bubble, uh, dealing with a lot of triggers. And when I'm going to an event right now, I really need to make sure that the next day I am recharging because if I follow up on the next day on the event, and if I don't have any pauses in between, then that is over triggering me. So I went to an event last, last week on Thursday. I knew that the event was there. It was a full day, but I made sure that I uh, went out or left the event by four because that was my my max, and that's very important. And um, the thing that I was sharing before with Andrew in April is most of the times, because the fact that people don't know a lot about neurodiversity, it causes friction. It causes such a friction that the person who is neurodiverse, most of the time, also a lot of people don't know that they are neurodiverse. I would suggest read into it, watch a video, or better yet, watch, you know, go through the VR experience. That's a different case. But then again, you are able to see the, the, I wouldn't say the commonalities that you may have with somebody who's neurodiverse. And neurodiverse is a big umbrella, right? You have autism, you have ADHD. Do I know what I have? No. I, do I want to know? No, it doesn't have to be. But I know that I'm a high-functioning neurodiverse and a neurodivergent. And also what I know is I have misophonia. So um, when uh, my business partner, Anita Baisa, when she's calling me and she's standing near public transport, I'm not hearing her conversation. I'm hearing everything that's happening behind her. So I'm hearing the train tracks. I'm hearing all the noise in the background. And I also have dyslexia. I have different tools to use so that I can read and also understand it. But it takes a while for me to be able to process all the words and all the things. And luckily, I live in a digital age where it's it's easier to consume information it's easier but just want to share and i i know that i'm being very vulnerable right now which is something new or not something new something new that i'm i'm doing uh, when it comes to this topic i'm still figuring it out i'm still um walking this journey and today we are going to talk about the different learning styles because different people consume information in different ways. And that's why I am bringing, I'm having a conversation with, uh, first of all, April. April Renfrey, she is an educational consultant that focuses her time with working on, with international schools and globally mobile families with neurodiverse children. She helps international schools to improve their inclusive practices through 
pro professional development. And then there is Andrew. Andrew is the co-founder of the Art of Science of Joy and EQ, EQ Joy. Uh, the co. Uh, Andrew's mission is to use his passion and his skills to inspire and empower artists to live a more joyful field life. So we are having a conversation about the different learning styles. And let me start with you, Andrew. Uh, when it comes to humanize the workplace, what comes top of mind for you? Well, first of all, thank you, Vivian, for inviting me to be on your show today, despite not being an yeah. expert in this topic, <laughs> but having hopefully uh, an interesting point of view that will yeah. inspire others to think about this humanizing the workplace i think it's an incredibly important topic so thank you vivian for taking this on mm -hmm. there's so many things happening in the world to dehumanize us um, and yeah. if we're not careful we can see that also in the workplace um, where more and more you know i remember when i was um CEO, even then we, we were talking about people as FTEs, full-time yep. equivalents, yep. rather than than humans. And, you know, we were sort of putting them into 0.7% of a person um, into our Excel sheets and looking at productivity and all of these. It's very dehumanizing within Excel. Um, why is it important? Because I think people are caught on to this game. Um, and I think people are saying, no, I don't want that it's not good enough and that leads to two things i see is one that they either quit so some of the research i looked at last year showed i think that one in four people intended to quit their job yeah. in the next 12 months of which half of those wanted to do something completely different with their lives and and i believe a big part of that is that they felt that they weren't being treated as humans um in the workplace and the second part is perhaps even more frightening and more challenging for leaders is that many of those who remain as many as 80 percent hate their job or dislike their work and so they are quietly quitting yeah they're not actively quitting but they're just going through the motions one paycheck to the next trying to get under the radar or being even negatively disparaging to the company um, outside of the workplace. So I think those two are two huge reasons why we need to humanize the workplace to help with not only um, reducing churn, but also with retention. Yeah, I agree. And also touching upon what you shared right now, the 18%, right? And I believe that energy is contagious, whether it's positive energy or negative energy. And as you should know that Gallup recently shared an, an, uh, a study based upon the well-being, but also based upon in disengagement at the moment right now globally is, no, the engagement globally is 21%. So out of the 100%, 21% is engaged and the rest is disengaged. That's mm -hmm. alarming. Then you have the 18% people that are quiet quitting, that are sitting there whilst they want to walk. Then you have the 25% that want to walk away. And I'm just thinking like companies are losing money, but also people need to also realize what's in it for them. Why is it that they want to work for a company? Why is it that they want to stay in that position? And I, I understand there are uh, financial reasons, there are, you know, purpose reasons, but also realize that we live in a day and age where I wouldn't say you can easily find a job, but it's easier to find a job and to connect mm -hmm. and to find a place that matches your purpose that matches your values and see if their purpose the company's purpose also matches your values that's what i wanted to add mm -hmm. april i think we also need to acknowledge the fact that there are a lot of companies that understand this research and so they put that out there yeah right? that, that we understand our employees we we listen to who they are and we we value their their them as whole people mm -hmm. um, but under the service, they're still going back to what has worked in the past and they're still talking yeah. about FTEs and making their, their spreadsheets. So I, I think it's going to take some time to 
revamp the typical way that everything has always worked. And this is one of the things that's really frustrated me coming out of coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I was really hopeful that a lot of things would be changing because yeah. we started to realize some people do work much better from home. Mm -hmm. Some students function much better from home, right? Yeah. And we've gone right back to where we were, right? And so because of that, it's it feels to me as if we were just hoping to get back to the regular way it was um, because it made us more comfortable. And sometimes you, you, it's easier to deal with the demon, you know, versus the demon you don't know. Right. Ooh, it's easier to deal with it. That's the first time that I'm hearing that, but I, I get that it's, it's changing a behavior that has been yours for a lot of times. And also a lot of people or a lot of organizations say that this is the way we do it. So this is how yes. it needs to be done. And the moment that they, they won't change, but they don't want to change. That's when I'm just like, okay, but you're hiring me here to create some transformation exactly. and where transformation is needed. It's also, you know, a, it's helpful that you also change along the, the transformation as well. And, the other thing that you mentioned, um, yeah, there's so much that you mentioned, and I'm 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 losing my my thought here because I'm I'm also seeing that Jonathan is saying something. So I'll bring in Jonathan, and maybe it will come up. So Jonathan is saying translating humanizing philosophy into real practice. Yes, that's that's what we want to see. We want to see more of that. But also in the beginning, you shared that. Uh, they do share it in their job ads and they say that we, you know, we are a good company. We are taking better care of people. But then under the surface, other things are happening. On the surface, people are noticing and they are sharing it on TikTok. They are sharing it on LinkedIn. They are sharing it on so many other platforms. So we have to be cautious about the what is the way that you want people to perceive the workplace. What is that real feel that you want to leave behind? Mm -hmm. So I totally love that you are sharing that. Thank you, April, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to go to another question that Jonathan is asking. So Jonathan is, what do we do? How do we work with those fears? Can I go with yeah. that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. As, as someone that works quite a bit with behavior, um, this is one of the things that I see from the outside, right? I'm an educator. Yeah. Yeah. So putting my educator hat on and looking into the business world, um, it's a really interesting subject for me because I see things happening, especially take in, in, in sales, for instance. Mm -hmm. We are motivating people in very archaic ways to do something to make money for the company, right? Mm -hmm. And and we are creating monsters in <laughs> the way that we're setting up sales yeah. uh, in incentives. Um, yeah. And I think there's a lot of fear in changing what the known is, right? And and so people continue on with this. But I would, I don't have the solution. But I would really love to hear how Andrew would deal with that that piece of of how do you move away from the tried and true when you've got these huge tech companies that have always been, you know, sell, 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 and then you can make buku bucks. But on the way, they're cutting out every single person. So all the joy is completely lost and there's mm. no team. Andrew? I think you hit the nail on the head there, April, with the word joy. Um, <laughs> I think what we find is that, and, and what we've seen through the recent layoff cycle, there's again this transparency that's now happening on a very different level than before and people are saying yes this is not good enough there is a different way so i think companies have been caught out on this so what i see is the ones that are winning are embracing um transparency are embracing yeah. authenticity and walking the talk right so if they are laying people off they are taking a pay cut at the same time to equal that amount is to say that look 
it's everybody's in this, you know, because the ones that are doing it the worst are laying off the people and then seeing their own bonuses or their shareholder dividends rise. And, you know, people, I think, are just looking at that and saying, well, that's not fair. Yeah. So this this fairness or lack of fairness is something that we do. And I think there's two aspects to it. We have to look at this from the leader's position as the, then also from the employee's position. And, and I think that actually the employee position is the most interesting one in that I'm seeing there's a shift in power. Mm-hmm. Um, I see yeah. happening where, where people are realizing that it's not just top down yeah. anymore, that we have choices. And, and when we look at the joy specifically or happiness, you know, the research tells us that we have basically control of 40% of our happiness throughout our lives. Whatever happens to us is basically almost half that we do have control over. Whereas going back to the fear question that was raised, we tend to focus on that 60% where we don't have control, mm-hmm. which causes us to have the fear. Yeah. Right. And and that's partly, you know, due to our genetics um, of humans and, and fearing the unknown, having a negativity bias. So we're always looking at things sort of with a negative lens unless we make an active effort to find joy, to find happiness and to focus on that 40%. So I'd say that's the first place to lose the fear is to be empowered to realize your empowerment and to say that i have a choice um and it might always be an easy choice but there's always a choice to make and i think a lot of people are realizing that choice is maybe a lower salary maybe it's not chasing that sales bonus this quarter if it means i'm not going to see my family i think bill gates Mm -hmm. said today what did he regret you know not having time with his family and relationships and you know one of the richest people in the world who chased the dollar now admitting in his older years that he made a mistake that he should yeah. have focused on other things in life even even the I'm, I'm i don't know his name anymore but he's famous for his carpool karaoke a british uh tv host who james has corden. an american show uh, yeah. what do you say james corden yes yeah, james corden and he's leaving he's leaving a highly functional television program or tv uh, tv host because he wants to spend more time with his family and realizing that he's missing out on so many other things right and also when it comes to fear um something that i want to add on to what april and andrew mentioned is we need to unravel fear we need to ask questions from curiosity perspective. Ask the nice, ask the curiosity questions about where does fear come from? What can we do to unravel fear so that the fear is is not just a um, a phantom of the opera, for instance, or it's not just a Disney story? Because sometimes we make up a lot of fear, which isn't. Um, which isn't right, right? We are creating an elephant out of a out of a fly, which could easily be an, uh, a butterfly instead of a big elephant. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm hitting home. So Jonathan is saying that this hits home. I recently, I very recently made a choice to resign so we can enjoy the lifestyle we have chosen. Okay, good, Jonathan. Good that you're mm-hmm. sharing that. I am curious about what your what your journey will be. But coming back to um, to today's topic, understanding the different learning styles at work. And I'll start with April. Mm. For me, this is a big one. I, I, I work with lots of different schools um, and specifically around teaching assistance because it's kind of one of the things that's increased um, 50 fold since we started using teaching assistance, since we started yeah. keeping data on using teaching assistance in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, and it just keeps increasing over and over and over and over. And it's kind of become a Band-Aid method. And what we typically do, right, is we send out a, a job description for the role we're looking for and people apply for that role. And we, we all know the research, too, about when that when women apply for a job, they have to meet yeah. 90. You know, they need to know they can meet 95 percent, 90 percent. Exactly. exactly. And men only yeah. 60 percent. Right. Yeah. And so. In terms of teaching assistance, what I try to help schools put out there is what kind of people do you want versus what kind of um, what kind of holes are you trying to plug mm-hmm. in the school? Um, 
And then once you have a group of people at the school, have them tell you what their strengths and their weaknesses are, and then put people in those roles mm -hmm. rather than saying, Vivian, you have to do that. Andrew, you have to do that. April, you have to do that. I think you're going to get people that are, um, ex are able to live out their strengths in a very different way if you take into account what they have to say about what kind of employee they would be, what kind of learner they are, what they prefer to be around. Vivian, I can imagine you having a lunch duty in the cafeteria would not be the place for you to be with your misphonia, right? So no. <laughs> understanding, understanding that about people is yeah. really important. And it, I, it creates an environment where employees feel heard and seen. And I feel like that's going to lead to more retention and then people feeling like they're invested in the place they work and put forth even more effort. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can sit and eat everywhere, but when, uh, when I'm sitting next to the kitchen, I'm hearing everything that the kitchen is doing because they are using certain tones or the clicking, the clacking, or they are cutting something. Mm -hmm. So when there are large, when the noise is, lo is, is loud, and I'm having a really deep conversation with somebody, I sometimes say that, can we sit somewhere else because I'm distracted by the noise there that I have mm -hmm. to, I have to sit somewhere else. Yeah. But you have the power to say that about yourself. And I, yeah. I think we need to make an environment in the working environment where it's okay for people to say those things. True. I feel like we're starting to move in that direction. We're having a lot more conversations and, and shared vocabulary about um, neurodiversity. But one of my pet peeves is when people will throw around diagnoses as mm -hmm. something they do. Well, they'll say, I'm totally OCD because I had to organize my desk. Yeah. No, oh yeah. It has absolutely yeah. nothing to do with yeah. that diagnosis, right? And yeah. so understanding the the importance of of knowing what those things mean and using the words in the right context. Yeah. Um and and not using them at, in disparaging ways uh is yeah. really important in the workplace as well. That's a that's a very good thing that you were talking about. Now I remember what what made me uh the light bulb you mentioned something about we haven't learned a lot from COVID where there were so many things from the lockdown. There were so many things that we were pausing, remote working, that we were doing a lot of things that were adding, fueling other people their cups, right? Now people, now there are workplaces that are demanding people to go back to work. I even saw somebody sharing a post about a company that is using a particular software so that they can register when people are sitting behind their desk and when they are not sitting behind their desk, then that means that they are having a break. And I'm just like, since when do we have to go back to that whole control micromanaging stuff, right? Um I I I don't I don't understand where that comes from. But then again also in which organizations which organizations are asking people, what kind of a learner are you? How do you consume information? That question, mm -hmm. I've never had that question. Yeah. I don't, I haven't either. Um, and it's one that I, I prompt as many people to ask as possible, just because mm -hmm. that, if we're asking that of, of our students, yeah, we need to expect the people that are working with the students to understand those things about themselves. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and one of the, I've always said for the longest time, I would just love for people to have a ticker tape going across their foreheads, right? You know, <laughs> what's going on today? What do I need to know to be able to address you in a way that's going to meet your communication style for the day? Um, yeah. and, and and so it would be so nice. And then it would take the onus off of me to be able to say, this is my crap today. This is what, you know, please don't make references to this because this really gets to me, you know, things like that would be so nice, but we don't have that luxury, do we? So well, you uh, can them. you, can you repeat the ticker sentence that you want other people to use? So what should be on our forehead again? Uh, well, I would like to be able to just see, you know, 
this is what I need for you to speak with me about today, or this is how I'm feeling today. This is how I'm coming to you as a person today. Today, I'm not going to be able to concentrate very well because I have this on my mind. You know, all of the things that you wish you could know about someone to be able to meet them where they are at that moment in time. Um, so the, <laughs> thank you. So when we have a ticker tape, that's great. Um, but wouldn't it be so nice? There was yeah. some organization that was doing a communication work with different uh, groups of people. And, you know, they they were categorizing their communication styles by color. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So then they had those color blocks on their desk. So when people walked by, they would know what kind of a communicator they were so they could meet them where they are. Um, I think we could really take that a lot further. Definitely. Oh. I'm I'm just joking. I I uh, doing tickers is not it's not part it's not helping at all. I was just putting it out there. But fun. it is it is definitely fun and it is also very helpful to know to know somebody's mood or to even know, you know, what they have in mind, what where do they want the conversation to go, what questions do they have so that you don't have to guess. So I definitely can share that. And Andrew, what can you say? Yeah, I think it's such a complex topic mm -hmm. in the fact that there are many aspects feeding into this, so I can't actually deal with them all. A couple of things I'd like to add to the conversation, especially based on what April's saying. One is about understanding emotions, that I think we're at a stage where many of us have great difficulty understanding other people's emotions either you know because we don't know how to do that or because we don't mm -hmm. have the time or we don't put effort into the time in this seven second world of you know our short-term intention span is down to seven seconds so if we're relying on that to pick up on emotional cues we're done yeah right? it's just not going to happen so if we don't have that ability or we don't have the time or make the effort to do that, I think the communication becomes really difficult um, because, as April says, we don't have this transparency of what the other person is feeling, what the other yeah. person is going through. So I'd like to see more companies invest in helping their employees relearn um, or learn their emotional um, EQ their intelligence, so to speak, so they can have more empathy for the people. I think, you know, this learning style is very much on the opposite side of the coin, a communication style. So, you know, I think they both go hand in hand. And the other thing I think that I could add to that is when you look at this problem from a business perspective, mm -hmm. I think the challenge is, as I said, it changes from one person over time. Yeah. And that might change from one day to the next or mm -hmm. in context. Right. So even if you look at people's um, how interested they are in something that has a huge impact on their ability to learn. So if you're trying to teach them something that they don't care about, but you do as a business, you need them to do this. It perhaps needs a very different style from if you're trying to teach them something they're innately curious about. So it's, which mm -hmm. is, I love what April said about hiring for culture. Yeah. That if you make sure you're building a team where these things are already taken into account and at that time and then matching positions to the tasks in the same way, I think that removes a whole heap of the problem from a leader's perspective. That on a day to day level, you don't need to concern yourself too much anymore about this because everybody is already in the right position everybody is already understanding what their role is what they need to do and they're becoming much proactive in their learning style right? but then again andrew you mentioned something and i'm gonna be a uh, devil's advocate with this uh question right now what i want to say because you said that it would be awesome that it would be good that companies would invest for people to find out how they can communicate emotionally right and i'm just thinking like okay how many leaders are thinking right now like i'm not gonna pay for that why should i pay for that because this is a personal thing that it needs to happen from their side right it's not something that an organization 
uh, that I'm, I'm just, you know, playing devil's advocate. It's not something that an organization should should be investing in. Why should I invest in personal stuff? It's the company is professional, not personal. Yeah, and, and this is part of the humanization or dehumanization mm -hmm. mentality. Um, yeah, true. For that, but when you when you look at the the data, so we go back to salespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the data on salespeople, if we look at data salespeople who are happy in their job, yeah, um, you know, they're between thirty and forty percent more effective at sales than those who aren't. So, if any leader out there is looking for an ROI on why you should care about these soft skills, mm -hmm. it's right there. Yeah, right? true. That you're going to get more out of these people, especially when it comes to creative tasks. Yeah, and I think you know, it's the way technology is moving so quickly we're going to more and more rely on the people in our organizations for creativity based tasks yeah. where you're going to need curiosity you're going to need to have people with a high eq mm -hmm. rather than a high iq so that would take us back to the whole school system and i could talk forever about how the whole school system <laughs> should invest in eq rather than iq I'm let's get the kids yeah ready at kindergarten i would push i would push back a little bit on that we need people you know that are that for this creative part right because i think there can be creativity in every role yeah um, and that comes from you know allowing people to come at problems in their own way right mm -hmm. so if you're a manager that is a micromanager then you're expecting your team to only go through and solve problems the way you would yeah. Right. So and what's the point of having a team if you're not going to utilize all the different abilities of the people? And one of the things that has actually been debunked over the last 20 years or so is the notion that we all have our one learning style. Um, and when Andrew brought up the idea that um, it depends on the day, it depends on where you're at at that moment. Right. And how you're approaching a problem you are going to um, add your, your ability to solve the problem by using different parts of your abilities. And that doesn't always mean you're going to use one learning style, right? And so if we're letting people on our team, we're giving them a range of, of where to come in, you know, like I need you to solve this problem, but please come at it how you want. And please use your creativity in solving this really, big hairy problem that's when we're going to get people that are going to exceed expectations because you didn't put the the kibosh on their ability to, yeah. to do it in their way no that's that's so true and i want to for those of you who aren't familiar in what kind of learning styles there are available let me share my screen so that you can see it um, there are more learning styles available, but these are the top four learning styles. So we have one is kine kinesthetic. Is Am I yeah. saying this right? Yeah, um, kinesthetic. Okay. Uh, prefer hands-on approach for learning and using all five senses of touch, sight, smell, sound, and taste. I don't know how that works when I'm doing a, a, a workshop, but okay, I'll, I'll pass on to the other version because I'm a visual learner. I myself, I love to see every time that somebody's talking, I'm painting an image in my mind and then I can, you know, paint the whole picture or create a whole movie. So I'm a visual learner. I consume books by reading and listening to audiobooks. So I'm looking at the book, but I'm also listening to what the author has to say so that it sinks in. And uh, this is my favorite way. And then there is reading and writing. It's not that. It's not part of my favorite way. What What is your le favorite learning style? Mine are, I, I yeah. use a little bit of all of them, quite honestly. But I've noticed for myself, my I have a desk that goes up and down, and I have a mm. treadmill that goes underneath. And yeah. I know if I need to write something, it it just flows out of me a little bit better when I'm walking at the same time. Um, I often find myself coming up with ideas when I'm taking a walk in the woods around here and I have yeah. to quickly, you know, say it into my phone. So I'm sure that when I'm moving, something is more activated in my brain. Yeah. Um, but I'm also very auditory. I'm a musician and um, it's directly linked to 
something something in my body, right? So if something mm-hmm. got an itch when I'm if in the middle of a musical situation, I get a stomach ache. Like I have yeah. a physical reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when I hear someone's voice, I hear tone and pitch and all of those things. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I, it depends on the day, it depends on the moment and depends on what I need to do. But I think I'm more of a kinesthetic learner than anything else. Yeah. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, same. Um, touch to me is extremely important. Mm-hmm. And, and also trying to conceptualize how something looks and feels. So building models um, mm-hmm. is a way that in a workshop type way that would sort of work for me, mm-hmm. that would be sort of very hands on type get the, the toilet rolls and all sorts of other things onto the table. And start from the I don't want to know problem. what's that used for. I don't want to know. <laughs> well, you have to watch Apollo 13, Vivian. They, they use toilet rolls for amazing things to get that, um, get that rocket capsule okay, back into, okay. into Earth's orbit safely. So there's many, yeah. many useful roles for empty toilet rolls, um, for sure. So, I think that's important for me. I think, you know, reading and writing is the hard one these days because of the short term memory issue I alluded to earlier. Um, You know, the science says that human short term memory is basically halved in the last 10 years um, down to seven seconds, uh, basically, you know. So the evolution of all the devices created that. Largely technology. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And we've also created ways that we can we can take in information so much faster too, right? So, uh, in in my world, students with disabilities have only been the ones afforded these extra um, technology pieces, like speech to text or listening to Mm -hmm. something. Um, But in reality, in companies, you you, don't you remember in the old movies where you see the the secretary doing the shorthand of someone dictating the letters? It's yeah. been happening for all time. And this is the way that we, you know, have shortcuts and get things done quicker. Yeah. So why are only a certain set of students being afforded these, these technology pieces in the classroom where, you know, maybe if the the goal is you to work on handwriting, you have to make kids handwrite a paper. But mm-hmm. if the goal is what the content is of it, who cares yeah. if they're typing sure. or if they're using a ballpoint pen or a pencil or a marker or whatever it is i just i think we need to take off or all use of a it. voice note right i to, to be honest everything that i write and i have otter to thank for that so otter is a speech text tool with confirm suit which uh transcribes everything that i'm saying into uh text without otter i wouldn't be able to write as fast as i am and then i have a gazillion tool so people who know me or work with me they get bummed out with the, the amount of tools that I'm working. And I'm just like, it's working for me. That's I fooled right. you because I've never ever disclosed that uh, until now that I have dyslexia and some people know, which I'm fighting a hard time to share, but uh, many people have dyslexia and they don't disclose it because out of fear of retaliation or fear of not being able to get the job. And I'm just saying, I have a different way of consuming the information and I found ways to make it manageable. If you are writing a text and not putting any structure in it, then you're you are only giving me the chance that I will read emails. I, I recently received an email that is just only text with no air, no no structure. I'm not I won't I won't I won't be able to read it. Mm-hmm. And I won't even try my best to be mm-hmm. able to read it because I'm just like, if it's that important to you to connect with me, find my way of talking to me, but also add space when you want to talk to me because right. I get a lot of messages, a lot of emails. So be considerate and add some, you know, spacing when you yeah. text me. <laughs> Well, you're not extremely unique, Vivian, because one yeah. in 10 people are dyslexic at yeah. this day and age, right? So yeah. it's a very, very common diagnosis and it's a very common undiagnosed neurodiversity. True. Mm-hmm. True. 
True. And now it's interesting with the AI, right? Because yeah. the AI, a lot of that is still very much text-based. So, you know, there's an over-dependency at this time. I don't know how long that will last before the other ways of learning catch up. But, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at AI, it's predominantly the AI's learning style is text-based yeah. learning. And we're feeding it with all this text and it's producing stuff back to us. Yeah. And maybe AI's best learning isn't words maybe yeah. it's um kinetic and it is possible to though to feed, to feed images to ai so that they can recreate or change the image right so i think that um the the most famous one of the most famous uh paintings is the the girl with the with the pearl earring or the pearl earring i've seen ai creating different images based upon just that image and it's and it's also similar to AI um, letting Drake, for instance, read a book instead of singing or rapping, right? That's all possible. And now I'm fearing that somebody might be using my voice to maybe trigger my partner or to trigger somebody else that I'm calling them. It has been, there are signs out there that people are being tricked and fooled by other people, their voices. And I hope that it doesn't go that far. Mm. Yeah, definitely. We don't have any yeah. assurances to give you, unfortunately. No, I don't know. I, I hope that <laughs> it doesn't happen to that. So when it comes to providing the different learning styles or organizations providing different tools for different learning styles, what is one thing that you want them to take away from this conversation? April. <laughs> I would say listen. Yeah. Ask ask the right questions and create a culture yeah. in your workplace that is about EQ and, and trust that the people that are in your organization are there because they know what they're doing, presume competence mm -hmm. and help build the culture. And yeah. then only at that point, put the questions out there and say, what is your learning style? Do you have accommodations that we can provide for you? Mm. And, you know, so the, the other part that's really important is that most accommodations on average cost about 50 US dollars. Yeah. So I think a lot of companies get afraid that, oh my gosh, we don't have the budget for this. Yes, you do. And you do if you're going to take care of the people that work for your organization. So that's right. Imagine what you could win when you invest $50. You could win so much more. So thank you, April, for uh, sharing that. And Andrew? I think it's to spend time thinking about the questions that you're framing mm -hmm. um, and to make sure, to, I think to April's point earlier, that you frame them broadly enough that within that box, people have the freedom, the space, again, to your point, Vivian, within that, that space, that box, they have the space to apply different learning styles mm -hmm. to, the problem, to the problem because I think part of the problem is we're defining boxes too tightly we're defining questions too tightly the people really force down a learning style and then it becomes hard as a manager to create space within a very tight box yeah. for people to actually learn in a different way because you frame yeah. the question too narrowly so I would say as, as a leader go broad with the questions you're asking which will give space to people to find their own learning styles, use these tools, the fifty dollars tools that they talk about, <laughs> to do that, because they're no use if, yeah. the, if the problem you're trying to solve is too tightly defined. True, true. I really enjoy this conversation. Thank you both for being on the show, and for those of you who are watching or listening to the replay or re-watching it, thank you for watching it. And if you have any questions or anything that you would like to know. Uh, share them and I will try and do my best to answer them. So thank you for watching and until next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.